I want to continue to brag on God, but I'm going to kind of do two for one here. Um, anybody like getting engaged in a Facebook argument? Aren't we really good at being keyboard warriors? What'd you say, Jacob? No, you don't argue with people on Facebook Marketplace. That's a different story. <laughs> Jacob's like, no, that's not your car. <laughs> So, back on September 24th, uh, just hear me out. God did something. This is back in line with what we're talking about. Sometimes you do your part. God's always doing his part. But you got to do your part, but then you got to rely on the third person to do their part. If I'm counseling you, God's doing his part. I'm doing my part to counsel, but then you got to do something with it. We talk about this a lot, or we have. So, sometimes you got to do your part and back off. But what we do as humans is we say, well, they didn't do their part, so I'll press in harder. And that's when we take on the false burdens. All right, so back on September 24th, I posted about us as a church celebrating Yom Kippur. And I posted e explanations for every fall festival of why we as Gentiles celebrate God's feast. And here's a response I got. I will not say this person's name. He said, you want to live under the law? I'm just thankful to be free in Christ Jesus. You can keep those ceremonial laws. I'm good, though. My response to him was, if you want to have a healthy conversation about this with Scripture, I'll be happy to. You're adding some words to my post that I didn't say. My phone number is 865-300-9625. Please call me, and I'll be happy to explain I am free under the blood of Jesus. How many of you think he called me? Right? Okay. Okay. I'm going to give you the human side, and I'm going to give you the God side. The human side of me about a week later wanted to respond and say, hey, did you forget? Did you forget about hammering me on Facebook and that you can't come out from behind that keyboard and be a man and call me? That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't. I prayed for him. Three and a half weeks this went on. I heard nothing. So almost a month later this week, I get a private message and I'm like, oh, great. I woke up to it at like 5 o'clock one morning. And it said, sorry to bother you so late because he sent it the night before. Please do not respond with haste. It's on my mind, and I want to ask you before I forget, do you observe the Torah? Okay, everybody knows Torah is the first five books of the Bible. So I've got this guy that kind of hammers me about I'm law-based and not under the blood of Jesus, who does not know me, who obviously has not listened to what I say, he does not answer when I say I will talk to you, and now he hits me with that question. How many of you think I was mad first thing that morning? How many of you realize that if I could have crawled through Facebook Messenger, I'd have been arguing like Jacob does on Facebook Marketplace, apparently? But I prayed. Because Paul says, and I'm sharing this with you for a few reasons. Number one, if you're new to our church, you may not know what we mean when we say this, so you're going to hear it. Number two, I think it's always good that we get reinforcement. Number three, Paul says to be ready to do what? Explain your faith. You should always be ready to explain your faith, not ready to get Jason or Wendy or we'll say Eliza now to explain your faith, right? So I want you to fully understand where we are. If you haven't gotten it yet, and then here, there's an end. There's a good end to this, okay? My answer was, do I observe Torah? I'll be happy to answer this question. If you are looking for a simple yes or no, it won't be that simple. First, let's define God's Torah. Torah is a Hebrew word. It's Hebrew. It's English translation is what? Instructions. Thank you. So the question is, do I follow God's instructions? See, he's got this mind around Torah, law, bad thing. I'm taking it to what it really means to change the question that's the same question, okay? The answer is yes. The best I can, but let's go deeper. Based on your previous response to one of my posts about festivals, I'm assuming you have the stance that God's Torah was done away with by the blood of Jesus. So let's address that. Please show me one time in Jesus' teachings that he did away with God's Torah. In Matthew 5, starting in verse 17, Jesus says, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses, Torah, or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law, Torah, will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least, least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom. 
But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called the greatest in the kingdom, will be called great in the kingdom. So I said, let's break down these verses. I did not come to abolish God's Torah, his law, his instructions. I came to accomplish. Other translations say to fulfill. The Greek word for accomplish or fulfill is plero, which means to make full, to fill up. So Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the Torah. I came to fill it up. In Hebrew, the word used means to fully preach. So Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish, I came to fill it up. I came to fully preach it. You guys have heard this before. The next verse, he says, not even the smallest detail of God's law, Torah, instruction, will disappear. Verse 19, if you ignore the least commandment, the least instruction, the least Torah, and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom. But anyone who obeys and teaches God's Torah will be called the greatest. Then in verse 21, he starts to fully preach it up or fill it up. God's Torah says, don't commit murder, but I say if you're even angry with someone, you committed murder in your heart. Verse 27, the Torah, God's instruction, His law says, you must not commit adultery. I say if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. So Jesus took God's Torah and made it harder. The Torah given in Numbers and Deuteronomy, or the law, so to speak, is about the physical outward action. Jesus takes that action and makes it about the inward heart action. Jesus literally made the Torah harder on us. Yet many Christians are taught and believe that Jesus made things easier. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my Torah, keep my commandments. The Greek word literally ties back to the Mosaic law, Torah. These are the teachings of Jesus that many of us have been simply taught incorrectly. So now one might argue that Paul said Jesus is the new covenant, does away with the old covenant. I'm trying to hit his arguments without him telling me. I know what the arguments are going to be. First of all, a covenant is a promise from God. The law is an instruction from God. So let's make sure we're not lumping these two together. That's what many do. The Greek word for new covenant is better translated renewed covenant. God didn't replace his old promise. He renewed the old promise with Jesus, the Lamb of God, sacrifice to save us of our sins. If God made a promise, then cancel that promise as he made a new promise. That makes God, God a liar, double-minded. Quote, I promise this forever, stated in Torah. No, nah, I'll just change my mind and go back on my word and replace it with Jesus. That's not what God said. We're putting words in his mouth, and that's dangerous. So now let's get really complicated. Some of the instructions of God's Torah were for the Israelites in the land. Some were no matter where they were, and some were in the land only. So some don't apply to us because we're not in the land. Then we see in Acts that the Gentiles didn't know what they were supposed to do. Should we follow all the Torah or not? Paul and the church elders basically boil it down to two things. Don't eat food, sacrifice to idols, and stay away from sexual immorality. So there are two pieces of the Torah that are reinforced. Where do we find out what food is sacrificed to an idol? the Torah. Where do we find out what sexual sin is? The Torah. Now, these are the minimums that we as Gentiles are supposed to do. I have two thoughts here. One, do you want to meet Jesus who gave up everything for you and tell him you did the minimums for him? Guys, we preached on this. I don't. I want him to know that I love him so much that I'm trying to give everything I have to obey him, follow him. Second, how many Gentiles look at porn, cheat on their spouse, lust every day while trying to hide it all under the blood of Jesus? As Gentiles, we are adopted into the people of Israel. We don't have to do more than the minimums, but there's nothing that says we can't do more or shouldn't do more. I think it's up to each of us what level of devotion we want to have. If we give the minimums in marriage, we'll have a terrible marriage. If we give the minimums in our careers and jobs, we won't be rewarded. But now it's okay to simply give the minimum with our Creator and our Savior? Paul is adamant all through Acts that he follows and teaches the Torah law. Also, that thing about food to idols, the reinforcing to the Gentiles not to worship idols, like Peyton said earlier. How many Christians today idolize things over God? People, careers, money, sports cars, stuff, all while pleading the blood of Jesus. I can give you much more, but as you can see, this is not a simple yes or no question. I follow God's instructions as best I can. Many Christians will tell me I'm wrong because that's not how they were taught. Well, I'm giving 100% scripture, not my opinion, not how I was taught. The question is, will you be open-minded to the truth laid out in scripture, or will you ignore the truth? It's funny, 99% of Americans and Christians have been circumcised. Sorry, this is a little weird. 
have been circumcised, defined by Torah, and this is the one burden the Gentiles are complaining about, but Americans do it every day without thought or worry. That just always blows me away. <laughs> I say it's just a lot of irony and hypocrisy. The American church teaches many, many things incorrectly, uses scripture out of context to back it up, and won't be open-minded. Let me finish with one more scripture from Jesus. Matthew 23, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey what they t tell you, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease a burden. Jesus says, teach the law, Torah. Listen to them and do what they say. Don't do what they do. This would have been a good time for Jesus to tell them that they didn't have to do what the law says, right? But he didn't. He reinforced that God's Torah should be followed, but the religious leaders' actions are hypocritical and should not be followed. He points out that the law is not what's unbearable. It's what man does with the law and putting demands on people that's unbearable. Christians will say, I don't have to follow Torah. But you believe the rainbow is a promise from God that he won't flood the earth again. That's from Torah. I don't follow Torah but I believe in the Ten Commandments. Well, the Ten Commandments are defined in Torah as a summation of the Torah. <laughs> Again, there's more, but I hope you get the gist. So the short answer is yes, I follow God's Torah as much as I can. I rely on the grace of Jesus when I fail. I love my God and my Messiah Jesus so much that I want to do all I can to please and obey. I think that each of us will have different convictions of what we'll do or not do, and that's okay. I welcome your thoughts as long as you back them up and present Scripture. Have a great day. Okay. You've heard all that. I just wanted you to hear it again. You ready for his response? Because I was buckled like, I'm ready. Let's go. He said, I had a contradiction that I had been dealing with for a while. Remember, he sat on this for a month. I knew well that God's law is good and that it won't pass away until heaven and earth do. Last night, I came across the Greek word for fulfill. As you stated, it's plural, to fill up. It was strange to me that knowing this gave me a lot of joy. So you actually had a Christian dig into Scripture against what he was taught after he challenged me, and it gave him joy. Wow. <laughs> it's my duty to rightly divide God's Word and to study it. Jesus is my all, and I will never grow complacent, which is why I would like to apologize. With my comment, I'm sure I created strife that other eyes have seen. I am sorry, my friend. Growth means the world to me. Bless you, and thank you for your dedication. I wanted to pick a fight. I was ready for a fight, okay? <laughs> That's the human part of it sometimes. But all I did was do my part and present it to him, and God did the work. We don't have to beat it in their heads. That was going to be the only time I was, if he kept arguing, I was going to be like, dude, have a good life, man. What's my point? Jeff, God used Jeff to help someone this week that doesn't go to this church to lead someone else back to their church that ain't our church. And God used this this week to draw a young man that doesn't go to this church deeper into his word and into joy with him. Guys, keep doing what you're doing outside of here. Trust God to, for the results, not what you see. For a month I was mad and I didn't know that God was working on his heart. So I'm humbled. I have to repent. I had a lot of bad thoughts. I'll be the first to admit that, but God was working. Okay? I want that to be motivation to you. All right, thank you. That was phase one of today's talk. Quick announcements, because we've got some fun things going on this week. Men's group, Wednesday, 6.30. <laughs> Pete came to his first men's group two weeks ago. What would you think about it, Pete? Thank you, Pete. Another announcement. These are in the calendar. Tuesday, October 31st. That's a week from Tuesday. Anybody know what that day is? Halloween. Boo. I'm going to make everybody mad today. What'd she say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tuesday, October 31st. We're going to meet here at 6.30 p.m. for prayer and maybe some worship. That's how we're going to celebrate Halloween. Okay, we're going to pray to God. It's going to be kind of free flow or whatever, so come when you can. Come and leave when you can. We'll be here from, what, 6.30 to when? Whenever the ladies quit talking, so like 10? Okay. 
do as I say, not as I do, Jennifer. <laughs> Hopefully you know this by now, but we have a website and an app, so that's where you get the calendar to reinforce what's going on this Wednesday night with men. And then the next Tuesday with prayer. And then the next Thursday, which is like November 2nd or 1st, whatever that is, we got Chew in the Cud with Peyton again. He did an awesome job the other night. I think everybody's still digesting and chewing on that cud. But thank you, Peyton, who's exited the room. Um, I was supposed to show baptism pics, and I forgot to download them. Miss Ella got baptized. So we'll show those next week. All right, we're going to do our giving, and then I'm going to get into the teaching. So it won't be too long. Matthew 23, 23. This is kind of a balanced scripture. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. <laughs> Once again, Jesus is reinforcing the law. I'll be dang. <laughs> you should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Because if you really get into God's law, it's about justice, mercy, and faith. So, yes, we're asking for you to tithe. Yes, we need money to keep the lights on. But I need you to make sure that we don't get wrapped up in money so much we forget this ju justice, mercy, and faith piece, okay? That's the motivation for today. This is our ways to give. Cash in the giving box in the back. Checks made to follow him with us. A website or app or Venmo. Thank you to all that give. We pray for a blessing in your life. All right. Everybody ready? Today's going to be different. I know we say that a lot, but it's because we're different a lot. Today is going to be like a giant public service announcement mixed with a Peyton teaching coming out of my mouth. So I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but we're going to take a little bit of a break from the book of Acts, okay? And we're going to talk about a few things that are going on in this world, and I'm going to prove to you today that your Bible is relevant and alive. How many of you look at, be honest, you don't have to raise your hand. How many of you look at your Bible as a history book that also tells some stuff about the future? But how hard is it to realize that it's alive for today? How many of us honestly believe it's alive for today? Got a few people. Okay. I'm going to prove it to you. That your Bible is alive. And what's happening right now in the world is in it. Okay? Okay. I'll bet you all of today's tithing, I can prove that to you. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm joking. Now, if you've been with us for some time, this is hopefully going to connect some dots, I hope. Uh, if you haven't, you may have to listen to this a few times to get all this. And you know what, if you've been with us, you may have to go back and listen to this a couple times. I hope you brought some pen and paper to write, because I'm going to give you some scripture to go to, give you some names, give you some Hebrew. But I'm going to start with a few questions to get your mind kind of wondering or maybe wandering. I'm not sure which it is. What does Halloween have to do with Hamas? What does a brain implanted chip have to do with Noah and with Hamas? <laughs> and one question that I hope if you didn't already get it and what I said earlier, you're really going to get it today is the Torah applicable for us today and alive today? Just a few questions to get your mind going. See, sometimes there's things that are happening around us and they have huge biblical significance and we just miss it. We miss it. We have no clue what's going on. We just miss it. And maybe there's multiple things going around us that are tied together and we see them as kind of separate weird things and maybe we recognize it's evil. But if we could just tie them together and understand that they're there and fulfilling biblical prophecy, it would mean more. But I asked a question earlier and I'm going to kind of state it now. The problem is many of us treat our Bibles as a history book, right? It's a history book all the way up to Revelation. And then Revelation's a goofy book about the future we can't understand. Tell me I'm lying. That is exactly what most of us think if we were totally honest. Yes, I realize that in some of those other books it talks about the future and prophecy and all that, but for the most part we view it as a history book. 
But I want you to walk away from here today understanding, if you don't understand everywhere we go, I just want to prove to you this book is alive. Gives history, yes. Tells the future, yes. But it explains things that are happening right now in our world in the Middle East. So I'm going to look at some things that are happening literally today as we speak and tie them to the past and the future. And I just want to make sure you understand. I'm going to say it again. We're living in Bible prophecy happening right now, but we've got to be careful we're not too busy to see it. All right, so we're going to kind of talk about this culturally, like what we're seeing in the world, then I'm going to tie it to biblical, okay? Two weeks ago, two weeks ago yesterday, October 7th, 2023, Hamas, a terrorist organization in Gaza, launched a surprise attack on Israel. Saturday morning on a Sabbath. You know what all the Israelis were doing? Resting. It's a Sabbath. Many of them didn't even have their phones with them. Not only was it a Sabbath, thank you, Parker, it was a special Sabbath. It was called a high Sabbath or a double Sabbath because it was the Sabbath at the end of the final festival of the year. Maybe you're going to get a little bit better idea today why we care about the festivals. It was at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. We were celebrating it, right? And I'm going to explain to you later, I'm going to come back to why this day is important in the story. So while resting, relaxing, an attack, a surprise attack was launched against Israel, and it's being called their version of 9-11. All of us know what 9-11 is, right? How many of y'all were born after 9-11? But you still know what 9-11 is, right? <laughs> Lonnie gave me a look like, <laughs> I'm not saying we're old. I'm saying, even if you weren't alive, you know what 9-11 was. It was an infamous day in history for our nation, and you know what it is. And that's what Israel, that's what we're calling this. This was their version. But if you take the number of Israelis that were killed, and you look at the size of Israel, Israel is about 7 million people. The United States is about 330 plus million. It was fewer back in 2001 when this happened, but let's just go with numbers. Let's put it in perspective. If you look at the size of Israel versus the size of America, how many people died in America on 9-11? Compare that to Israel. It would be like 60,000 people died that day. See, we can look at it and go, it was just 1,500 people, but to them that would be like 60,000 people to us. This was hugely tragic for them. Huge. This took a significant part of their population away just like that. But here's the thing. Three weeks ago, many Americans didn't even know the name Hamas existed. Didn't know anything about it. But now, all of a sudden, overnight, it's a household name, kind of like ISIS or the Taliban, right? So today, we're going to look into who Hamas is, how they rose to power, because Hamas is unique. Most terrorist organizations that inflict terror, that do it with religious ties to Islam like they have, most of them don't have complete government control over an area, right? They have like a fear control, but they don't have government control. But Hamas is actually the government of Gaza, okay? So I want to put this in perspective, and I'm sorry this is a little bitty picture. But this is the nation of Israel from here up to here. Can you see that? Gaza that we're talking about is this little bitty strip right here. That's where Hamas is. Okay, and I'm going to give you the history in a minute, but that little bitty strip, and Peyton has showed some of these pictures before, but I'm going to argue that when he showed them back in March or May or whenever that was, we were kind of like, oh, cool, that's a map. And now we're like, oh, crap, this is happening. We may ought to pay attention. So this is the state of Israel, often compared to being less than the size of the state of New Jersey. This is not a big country. This is a small place. We're going to get into some of its surrounding nations in a minute, like Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt. Okay, we're going to get into that in a minute. But you see that we're talking about Hamas being the government of this little bitty strip called Gaza. Okay, everybody got that? By the way, if I get ahead of you, speak up. Tell me to stop. Tell me to slow down. Tell me to say it again. I'm begging you, okay? If, I'm, if I go too fast, too far, or whatever, just stop me, okay? So Gaza... We'll go back to this. Gaza kind of is, or you might say was, a part of Israel until 2005. Anybody know why Israel gave up Gaza? 
for peace. For peace. So you got this, we're going to dive deep into this, but you got this Jewish nation of Israel against the Islamic nation of, quote, Palestine. So you hear Palestinian, Palestine, that's the Muslim nation, the Islam nation that's going against the Jews. And Israel says, we'll give you up this little piece of land that you think is yours. We'll give it to you for peace. And Gaza said, or the Palestinians say, deal. Well, where did that lead to? Did that really work out for Israel? Two thousand five, Israel gives up Gaza for peace. Hamas comes in as a terrorist organization, but then they were voted in by the people and the government in two thousand six. This is what I meant by they're unique. They are gut. They are the government. So Israel gives up the land for peace in 2005, only to have their version of 9-11 as a thank you for the land from the same group. So I'm going to explain to you here in a minute why we should not expect peace. How many of you have heard pray for peace in the Middle East? I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. I'll get ahead a little bit. You're wasting your time. It'll never happen. It's never going to happen. Now, Let's go a little deeper, the cultural side. It's important to realize, anybody know who Hamas is funded by? Because Hamas doesn't just operate in this tiny little village over here by themselves. There's like 2 million people. It's pretty heavily populated. Iran. So Iran funds Hamas, and I heard, I've heard different numbers, but I heard they give at least $100 million a year to Hamas. Okay. Iran has publicly stated many times that they have a goal, not for world domination. To wipe out the Jews. They publicly state, death to America, death to Israel, we want to wipe out the Jews. Peyton said it, they call one of us little Satan and the other one big Satan. Little Satan's Israel, we're big Satan, I guess. But they don't say we want to wipe out all of America, they say we want to wipe out the Jewish people. But why? Why would they want to wipe them out? I'm asking a lot of questions I'm going to hopefully answer later, but I'm trying to get your mind going to think places you may not normally go. So does anybody know what a proxy is? I'm, I'm using all these terms you hear on the news, and I just want to make sure everybody knows what it means. So Israel creates, or I'm sorry, Iran creates what we call proxies. So let me give you a best example I can. If I needed to go vote for something, and I couldn't physically go, I could send Jeff in my place to vote for me, and that's called a proxy. I tell him, Jeff, go vote for me, and I want you to vote yes. So he goes and places my vote for me. He's my proxy vote. He acts on behalf of me with the authority given for me. Does everybody get that? Okay, that's what Iran does. Iran says, we're not going to go do all this work and have our name smeared around and get everybody mad at us, so we're going to fund these, quote, proxy wars, we're going to fund these proxy groups. Hamas, we'll give you some money. You go fight on our behalf. You go destroy the people of Israel. And we'll sit over here and just chant death to America and keep our name clean. Okay, does that make sense? So essentially they're funding terrorist organizations to control them, to have them fight wars on their behalf. But everybody knows it's them, but nobody's doing anything about it. So Iran funds at least 12 militias like Hamas. So for one Hamas, there's at least 11 more things they're funding. So you hear terms like Hezbollah and things like that. And that's over six countries. And I'm going to show you a new map. Bahrain, Iraq, Lebanon, just in general the Palestinian territory, Syria, and Yemen. Let's talk about that. Here's that little bitty sliver of Israel. You starting to see how small it is now? What's all the fuss about that little piece of land? It's a little bitty piece of land over here. And you got Iran over here. They're not fighting, but they're paying people in Syria, Hezbollah, to attack from the north. Last week, we told you the government is not telling you that we're bombing Hezbollah. This week, if you watch the news, we're bombing the crap out of, or I'm sorry, Israel's bombing the crap out of Hezbollah. Sometimes they do things and don't tell the truth about it, right? So it, Iran's funding Hezbollah to attack from there. Iran's funding Hamas to attack from here. Iran's funding somebody in what's called the West Bank here to come in and fight. They're, they've got Israel surrounded. 
And then you got this. Anybody know what this is right here? Saudi Arabia. Does anybody know what Saudi Arabia was doing two or three weeks ago, say three weeks ago? Negotiating a peace agreement with Israel. So Iran's like, we can't have that happening because we got them pretty much surrounded, so we can't have someone else that's got them surrounded wanting peace, right? So boom, Hamas invades, and all heck breaks loose, okay? This week, we have... We have Air Force bases. I'm looking. See, this is, we got Syria, Jordan, Iraq. We got Air Force bases in this area. And our Air Force, our, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if they're Air Force. Our military bases were attacked this week. Our bases were. Then, down here in Yemen, because it's way away, Yemen, we got some ships down here in Yemen started firing drones and rockets at Israel and our ships shot them down so guys this is when we say this is a powder keg like see it's exploding it's happening and I want you to understand how this looks and who is the this is what's called the head of the snake Iran's the head of the snake using all these other people to do it okay I'm going to try to move on because I don't want to spend all of our time talking about the culture I really want to get to the biblical part We need to understand biblically what is happening, why it's happening, how it's happening, so we can stand strong and pray correctly. We want to pray, right? Pray for Israel. Pray for Israel. Pray for what? Do we pray for peace? Do we pray for destruction of Hamas? Do we pray for destruction of Iran? What do we pray for? <laughs> John says, peace by destruction. Hamas launched a brutal attack on Israel. Hamas uses people as human shields. Hamas live streamed the murders and other horrific things that I can't say up here in front of children. To women, children, babies, and the elderly. Hang on to that for a moment. As this happened, people celebrated all over the world that were Palestinian. They celebrated. They gave out candy to celebrate. These people who are the worst of all evil exposed themselves, but in just two weeks we see support for Hamas in our own country, in our own Congress, in our own universities where kids have been brainwashed. And I warned you on day one, you can go back and look at Facebook, I warned you on day one, mark my word, support for Israel will change when they start defeating. When they start, when, they're start, when the Palestinian casualties start piling up, things will change, and we're already seeing that in two short weeks. Pro corporations joining, Lonnie says, protest all over our country and all over the world in support of Hamas. Even yesterday I saw some Jews in Brooklyn protesting. High school students, Peyton said. All right. By the way, Benjamin Netanyahu, who's the prime minister, he's kind of like the president. They have a president, but you, nobody knows his name. He's a figurehead. Benjamin Netanyahu, he's the main guy. He's like our president. He's called a prime minister. He saw this coming 10 years ago, and he wanted to bomb Iran to stop the head of the snake. And you know who stopped him? In the name of peace, the United States of America. So we're a part of this. We're a part of this. When you keep wanting peace, but there's not going to be peace, bad things are going to happen. So that's sort of the cultural snapshot of what's happening. Let's dig into the biblical aspect. This is where we're going to need to get your pens out. We've talked a lot about biblical holidays. So today I'm going to explain to you another reason the biblical holidays matter. The Hebrew word for holiday is hagim. Okay? Hagim. Hagim means a circle. We've talked about this before. As Westerners, we look at everything very linearly. linearly. It has happened. It's done. What's next? The Jewish culture looks for things to happen again and again and again. So even their holidays are, are the name of, the, of the, the term holiday means circle. They don't look at a holiday as just a past remembrance they look at it as a reoccurrence, something that's going to happen again. 
And every holiday points to a different aspect of God's plan of redemption. Remember, Passover was a past experience to remember, right? The death angel passed over the houses with the blood on the door frames, ultimately leads God's people out of Egypt. That happened. That's a past event to remember. But from a reoccurrence perspective, we've taught you Jesus died on Passover. It circled. It didn't happen once. We remember Passover. It's circled. Multiple things happen on those holidays that are significant in God's timeline. We tend to look at holidays, though, as a thing that happened in the past that doesn't happen again. So we've got to get our mindset off what we see as a holiday. And, and I guess an example of that would be we have Thanksgiving as a holiday, okay? We're thankful for that. Pilgrims come together with the Indians. They all eat, sing kumbaya, and once a year we get together and eat good food till we pass out. But we don't look for Thanksgiving to happen again, right? It happened and we will celebrate it in a certain we'll celebrate it every year, but it only happened once. That's the way we see holidays. The Jewish people say it happened, it'll happen again. It'll happen again. It'll happen again. Everybody clear on that? The first biblical holiday on the calendar, man, I feel like Peyton today. I feel so proud. The first biblical holiday on the calendar is Passover. It's on the 14th day of Nisan. I'm going to keep this simple for our brains. It's not simple. It's complicated. You remember Peyton explained we've got two Jewish calendars. you got the uh, civil calendar and then the religious calendar. Peyton's giving me thumbs up like he finally got it right. <laughs> if we look at the religious calendar, the first month is Nisan. That would be like our January, okay? The 14th day of Nisan is when Passover happens. Now, you guys know this. But a word or a letter in Hebrew can have a numerical phrase, a word. It's it's often, like Peyton said earlier, much more than just the word, and we just we dummy that down. But there's a numerical value. I'm sorry, there is a word that goes with a numerical value of 14 in its hand. Okay? So God redeems Israel on Passover with his mighty hand. Had to be on the 14th day because his hand, that's the significance. Do you get that? His hand of redemption. All right, now fast forward to the last biblical month of the calendar. It's called Adar. That would be like our December, so to speak. We celebrate something called Purim. Do you guys remember when we did Purim? I'm going to test if you remember. Haman. Mordecai. Yeah, you remember. (laughs) Good, this will be easier. (laughs) We have Purim that happens in the final month, Adar. That's the deliverance of Esther and Mordecai. You don't have to boo and yay every time I say these names. It's the deliverance of the Jewish people, and guess what day it happens on in that month? You guessed it, the 14th. So the hand of God on the 14th of Nisan delivers the people from Egypt. Now the hand of God delivers the people from Haman who wants to kill the Jews and Esther on the 14th of Adar. God's mighty hand has redeemed them, okay? So Jewish people see these these as bookends for the biblical year. The first month revealed the hand of God, God's hand in the beginning of history. Now the final month, God's hand at the end of history. God is in control. He has a purpose for all things. Even when things look bleak, God's hand delivered his people. Things look bleak right now in the Middle East for his people. They're surrounded on all sides. But we can trust and have faith that God's hand will deliver them. You getting that point? So the Jewish people, they expect as one of the final things for Purim to happen again. They're expecting Purim to repeat itself. And I'm going to explain to you why that matters. I told you it's deep. Do we remember the story of Esther? Story of Esther, we get Purim. Haman, boo, comes on the scene, and he gets mad at Mordecai. He wants Mordecai killed because Mordecai will not bow down to the king of Persia. But Haman doesn't just target Mordecai. Haman goes after the entire Jewish nation. He wants every Jewish person eliminated. He's the first person in the Bible that wants to completely eradicate the Jews. It's in chapter 3 of Esther if you want to go read it. 
all other nations that have come against the Jews, Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians, they took captives, they murdered some, but they didn't want to wipe out the Jews. Haman is the first person that wants them completely wiped out, and please remember his name, Haman, okay? Why is the story of Purim important to us now? Esther, Mordecai, Haman, want to wipe out the Jews? Guess where it happened? Iran, Persia. Persia is modern-day Iran. It was Persia until the 1930s or 40s or something like that when it changed to Iran. Do you see the similarity? Haman is gone, but there's a spirit. We can call it a spirit of Haman if you want to. I'm going to call it something else later. But maybe there's a spirit of Haman that remains in that territory. It's just like Jesus said. Jesus said, don't tolerate a Jezebel spirit. But Jezebel's dead and gone. But what that tells us is her spirit is still alive. And we have to fight against it in our churches. That's what Jesus is telling us. So Haman is dead and gone. He was impaled on a thing, right, on a, on a big stick. But it, the spirit of Haman still remains in Iran wanting to completely wipe out the Jews. This is the part where your Bible starts to come alive for you today. There is a spirit in Iran that says, I want to kill every Jew. I want to eradicate the Jews. And it makes no sense why they would want to do that. It's a spirit left over from where Haman lived, where the story of Purim took place. So Purim is the last month of the biblical calendar on the day of the hand. And there's a rabbi named Jason Sobel. If you haven't read his stuff, it's really good. He, he is a messianic rabbi. He believes in Jesus, and he digs through the Old Testament and finds Jesus in ways you would never imagine. Jason Sobel. He's the rabbi that they use, the chosen uses, to get some of their Jewish stuff correct. Jason Sobel. He said, I quote from him, he said, it's like the last chapter in history when Persia will arise again, that's Iran, and a modern-day Haman will arise. So it's like we're watching this modern-day Haman rise with a goal to eliminate the Jews, and they publicly stated it. So let's get back to Hamas. The Jewish people believe that everything that happens has to be in the Bible. Do we believe that? Everything that happens has to be in the Bible. Past, present, future. So what about Hamas? Is Hamas in the Bible? And what does it mean? So you've got to remember, as I break this down, in that region, they speak Arabic and Hebrew, two different languages. Very significant, but two different languages. Sometimes they're similar, sometimes they're not. In Arabic, Hamas is an acronym for the terrorist organization that means bravery, zeal, strength. But do you want to know what it means in Hebrew? Violence. Look at what they're doing. They say they're doing it in the name of Allah, God. And they're doing it by being brave, by being zealous. They're strong, but they're unleashing violence. Violence that we've never seen in our lifetime. I made a joke last year. They are making ISIS look like babies. If you have not heard some of the stuff they've done, come to me afterwards. I will tell you about how they are doing things to people to the point they're breaking bones that shouldn't be broken to do it. It's disgusting. Chopping off, oh, it's just disgusting. So in Arabic, it means bravery, zeal, strength, and that's what they think they're operating in. But in Hebrew, God's language, it means violence. In Genesis 6, Jumping kind of all over the place, but I promise it's going to tie together. We have the story of the evil angels. The evil angels breed with human women, and they create this race of giants called the Nephilim. So I told you today we're going to talk about the law. We're going to talk about Halloween. We're going to talk about the Nephilim. I'll try to think of anything else I can do to try to run people off with crazy discussions today. We'll throw speaking in tongues in there, and we'll get them all. All right, so Genesis 6, starting in verse 4, it says, In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God, those are evil angels that were cast down from heaven, whenever they had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. Anybody know how tall these giants were? I heard 1,000, I heard 400 feet, I've heard 200 feet, a lot taller than me, 6 foot 2, okay? 
They were huge. The evil angels breed with women, produce this giant race called the Nephilim. Verse 5, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought and imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry I ever made them. But, this is where you should praise the Lord, but Noah found favor with the Lord. Thank you, he found favor. Or we're not here, no one's here. Verse 9, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. The only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Isn't that cool that Noah's called blameless there? That doesn't mean he didn't do anything wrong. It's a mistranslation. The closer translation instead of saying Noah was the only blameless person is that Noah was the only person who was perfect in his generations. Many scholars take that to mean Noah was the only one left that didn't have Nephilim genes in him. So think about it. Why would God wipe out everything but this one man if he's trying to wipe out the entire race to repurify the human race back to what it was supposed to be? Now, we could teach on this all day long. There's some fun teaching there because Satan came along in the very beginning and tried to wipe everyone out from the beginning by creating these Nephilim because ultimately he knew the seed of Jesus would come out of this. He tried to stop humanity before Jesus could come. There's a whole teaching there, but that's not where we're going today. Verse 10, Noah was the father of these three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. Hebrew word, Hamas. Verse 12, God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Hamas. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. So in verse 11, it says filled with violence. In verse 13, it says I've decided to destroy all living creatures because they've filled the earth with violence. Both times, Hebrew word Hamas. So this ignorant terrorist group, literally has named themselves after God's something God stated he would destroy. You can't make that up. How did they just randomly pick that name and they picked it thinking they were doing a good thing? Bravery, strength, zeal. But in scripture it means violence. And God promises to wipe out violence. He promises to wipe out Hamas. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 37? He said, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in the day of Noah, like it was in Noah's day. In Noah's day, there was Hamas in the world. We just talked about that, violence. Now we have a terrorist group named Hamas actively trying to wipe out the Jewish people with violence. You can't make this up. Your Bible is alive, okay? We're living in a cycle right now. Where Hamas is happening, they want to wipe out the Jews, but God is still in control. Let's go a level deeper. This keeps going deeper for a while, and I'm going to bring it back up. Obadiah. Anybody ever read Obadiah? Most of us don't even know. We think that's some um, Obadiah. Isn't that that uh, guy rides in a buggy in a cart down the road down in Athens? <laughs> Obadiah, it's only got one chapter, so we're going to go to verse 10 of chapter 1. It says, because of the Hamas, because of the violence, you did to your close relatives in Israel, you'll be filled with shame and destroyed forever. Okay, you gotta, you got you to gotta pay attention here. Obadiah is speaking judgment on the descendants of Esau. Okay? Because of the Hamas, the violence. Anybody remember who Esau is? So you got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Esau's supposed to get the birthright. Jacob steals the birthright. I still don't understand that story completely. And Esau's mad at Jacob forever. Right? So I want to fast forward a little bit. There's a descendant of Esau named Amalek. And guess what? Haman is a descendant of Amalek. Okay? 
So Haman is a descendant of Esau, whose people committed Hamas against God's chosen people. Are you starting to connect some dots? Haman is a descendant of Esau through Amalek. And those people committed violence against God's chosen people. They committed Hamas against God's chosen people. And do you know how the Amalekites committed this violence that God was so angry about? They attacked women, children, and the elderly. Well, you can't make this up. It's happening again. It's cycling. The defenseless, that's who was slaughtered on October 7 was the defenseless, and that's who they slaughtered back then. Exodus 17, 16, he said, They have raised their fist against their fist against the Lord's throne, so now the Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation after generation. So there's a promise in Exodus, which is the Torah, that God's people will be at war with Amalek generation after generation. So they were physically at war with Haman. They were physically at war with Amalek, physically at war with Esau. But there is a promise here that there will be a spirit. I'm going to say forget spirit of Haman. It's a spirit of Amalek that's going to be at war against God's people forever. Stems from the seed of Esau, still trying to come against the Jews today, generation after generation. We go deeper. Y'all okay right now? I know it's a lot of data. I promise, I promise I'm going to try to bring it back. King Saul was told by Samuel, wipe out the Amalekites. Saul didn't do it. He allowed that evil to coexist, and that disobedience led to Haman coming generations later. And I said earlier, why would Haman want to wipe out all the Jews just because of Mordecai? Because Haman knew history, and he knew that the Israelites were supposed to wipe out all of his descendants. That's why Haman wanted to wipe out all the Jews completely. Because he knew that Saul had missed that. So we're talking about something that should have happened a few thousand years ago that didn't, and now it's still affecting the nation of Israel today. Hatred for the Jewish people. God knew a Haman would come. And history repeats itself. Remember, Peyton just taught about this with Ecclesiastes. They expect the cycle, the circle. They expect history to repeat itself. There's nothing new under the sun. And then Hitler becomes a Haman. Tried to wipe out the Jews. And now Hamas is a Haman. Do you see this? Generation to generation. The previous generation was Hitler. The current generation is Hamas. We're living out Scripture. We're living out the promises made thousands of years ago in Scripture that the spirit of Amalek would be against God's people generation after generation. It's a spirit, so it looks different. It, hits, it goes into Hitler over here in Germany. Now it's in Hamas in the Gaza Strip. But it's the same spirit of Amalek coming against them. Like you... Via their support from Iran, where Haman's from. You can't make this up. <laughs> but our God is a gracious, compassionate, loving, merciful, slow to anger God. And I'm very thankful for that in my own life. But he knows you cannot compromise with pure evil. You have to eradicate pure evil. So I'm going to tie this to us today. We allow way too much evil in our churches today. There's two lessons here for us. You're like, oh, this is a great biblical teaching. I have to listen to ten times to get all these names. But there's two lessons for us. You cannot have both God and evil. They do not coexist. There's part of your answer to the Halloween discussion. Churches have made it normal, but God has been clear over and over again. See what happened when King Saul didn't eradicate evil like he was supposed to? It had a consequence thousands of years later. So you cannot have evil and God at the same time. And if you allow a little bit of evil, it may have consequences from generation to generation. So when I ask you to repent of a sin and change, I'm asking you to change the generations of your family. Because if you just allow a little bit of evil in and just plead the blood of Jesus over it, you're still allowing a little bit of evil in. And you're still going to have consequences for a long time. We're warned about it. The nations 
Keep going deeper. The nations, the descendants of Amalek. Do you know where they lived? <laughs> In Gaza. Right beside Gaza. Right where the attacks happened. Really close. Right there where they came over the border and attacked that music festival. is pretty much where the Amalekites lived. Amalek is rising again, the spirit of Amalek. So I'm going to argue we don't need to pray for peace. We need to pray for the spirit of Amalek to be destroyed by Jesus, in Jesus' name, so that pe- God's people are spared. So I'm going to say, John, you're right. <laughs> we pray for peace by their annihilation. Oh, but as Christians, we're not supposed to talk about a people group being annihilated. God sure talked about it a lot. And we're promised conflict in the Middle East until the Antichrist shows up and also ushers in false peace. There is nothing in the Bible that promises peace for Israel. Nothing. Didn't Jesus himself say, I didn't come for peace? Look it up. Why did he come? Nation against nation. See, there's promised war. Until the Antichrist comes. So you're praying, pray for peace in the Middle East. That's awesome. you got a good heart. But you're praying for the delaying of the Antichrist to come. Because there has to be unrest in the Middle East for the Antichrist to show up and offer false peace. Do you understand that? So I want to encourage you, don't pray for peace. And if you don't agree with this, don't agree with it. you got to take what I'm saying and decide what you're going to do with it. But I'm not going to pray for peace. I'm going to pray for the spirit of Amalek to be rebuked in the name of Jesus and to be destroyed so God's people survive. And then I want to trust God that no matter what happens and what it looks like and who comes against them, they are promised to survive. Israel offered peace. So you want peace in the Middle East? Well, Israel offered peace, and it literally led to Hamas. If they didn't give away Gaza, there's no Hamas governing Gaza. Literally and figuratively and biblically, (laughs) Israel offers peace, and out of it they get Hamas and violence. God's people will be at war with Amalek until the Antichrist is revealed and all heck breaks loose, and Jesus comes to defeat the evil. By the way, anybody know what Amalek means? The name Amalek. It means a people that licks the blood. It literally means they're bloodthirsty. They have one goal, kill, spill the blood. They're bloodthirsty. So God takes this little bitty strip of land, Israel. That's where he chose to inhabit. That's where he chose to make holy, where he's the only God. And he will not tolerate evil that lives there. He will not. He holds the inhabitants of that land to a higher standard. By the way, we got all bothered by what's going on with all these people. You guys realize that God has been more severe on the Jews than anybody. He's been more severe on his own people being disobedient, okay? So this isn't about God against the world. This is about God wants us to be holy and dedicated to him. Simple. You obey God, you get a blessing. You disobey, you get a curse. I don't know about you guys, but I want the blessing, right? You want the blessing or the curse? If you want the curse, you're in the wrong place because we're not going to pet that demon. One more Amalek point. Somebody said this in a pre-service. I think Wendy said it, praying against it in a pre-service prayer. I love how God ties things together. Anybody want to take a guess at a word that has the same numerical value as Amalek in our English language? I don't expect you to get this. Doubt. The word Amalek has the same numerical value as doubt. So the spirit of Amalek is not just coming against the Jewish people. The spirit of Amalek wants us to doubt God, to doubt our faith. Because doubt is what opens the door to chaos. Jason Sobel said, Amalek wants to cool us down, make us lukewarm. Jesus had something to say about that too. To be hot or cold, don't be lukewarm. So God is in control. Everything has been prophesied. The end was prophesied from the beginning. And we have to grow our faith. Okay, anybody know what Hebrew year we're in? We're not in 2023. That's the Gregorian calendar. We're in 5784. Told you you're going to need a pen today. 84 (laughs) has the numerical value of faith. 
We just entered this year last month. Remember, their year starts in September or for us. Amalek equals doubt, but we're in the year of faith. They're going to try to turn us against the Jewish people, but we have to support them. We have to pray against the spirit of Amalek. So let's talk about Gaza for a minute. Anybody think Gaza's mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> Amos 1, 7. We want all these little books y'all don't ever read, and I don't either. <laughs> but I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces. For two weeks, fire has rained down on Gaza, literally. Guys, if you are not getting it right now that the Bible is alive, I'm not telling this right. <laughs> like, we are watching things happen that are talked about. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, this one might hurt a little bit, but if you are hearing this and you're not understanding that the Bible is alive, maybe you need to pray against that doubt spirit. That Amalek spirit. You guys okay with me going one more deep dive point? One more point deeper. In Genesis, Abraham is, good, I was going there anyway, but thanks for, in Genesis, Abraham has promised a son, Right? Abraham, like most of us humans, tries to get ahead of God's timing. God promised something, and he didn't want to wait 20 years on God. <laughs> so he goes out and gets old Hagar pregnant. She made him do it. I knew somebody was going to say it. But he knew better. <laughs> In Genesis, Abraham's promised a son. Abraham gets ahead of God's timing. He has a son named Ishmael. Isaac is the chosen son promised by God, produces the bloodline of the Jewish people, right? They carry the promise of Jesus. Isaac leads to Jews. Anybody know who Ishmael leads to? Muslim, Islam. In Genesis, we know that God promises Isaac many descendants, but he also promises Ishmael many descendants. We can't miss that. He promised Ishmael when Ishmael was kind of kicked out. He promised Ishmael he would have many descendants. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's Islam all over the world. Genesis 16, the angel of the Lord, and Peyton has taught us this, when it says the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply, that's Yeshua. That's Jesus talking. That's not an angel. An angel can't multiply. I, the angel can't create. But the angel of the Lord said to her, Yeshua said to her, this is to Hagar, Ishmael's mother, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord has heard your affliction, he shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. He is promising, Ishmael, you're going to have a lot of descendants. And you're going to be fighting people all the time. And you're going to be wild. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. This, in Genesis 16, is the start of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It starts right here. We know that this promise was made to Isaac for the Jewish people. Promises were given to Isaac, but then this guy named Muhammad comes along 2,000 years later and says, no, 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 you miswrote that. The promises were for Ishmael. But God has promised there's going to be a conflict between Isaac and Ishmael forever. Not forever, but for mankind. One more. Genesis 28, 9. Remember old Esau we talked about earlier? And he produces the Am Amalekites and Haman. Genesis 28, 9, so Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajeth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. You see what just happened right there? The conflict starts with Isaac and Ishmael. See, I went backwards from Hamas backwards. I'm about to go back forward. It starts with Isaac and Ishmael. Then Esau marries Ishmael's daughter, so he marries into the people that will hate Isaac's people, the Jews. His descendants become the Amalekites. Saul doesn't wipe out the Amalekites like he's supposed to. The Amalekites live near Gaza, ultimately produce Haman in Iran who wants to wipe out the Jews. Do you see the circle? 
Do you see the full circle of all of this that started way back in Genesis is happening right before our eyes? And I didn't say this is the final battle. I said the Jews are looking for that. This may just be another circle and we move on to another circle later. I'm hopeful this is one of the final battles. Right? I'm ready to get zoomed out of here. I love y'all. I love y'all, but I, I want to fly with you, you know? <laughs> there has always been war between Jews and Islam, and there will always be war. So quit expecting peace. If you expect peace and it doesn't happen, you're going to doubt God. But God never promised peace until the Antichrist is revealed and he brings false peace. I heard someone say this week, Christians believe the Messiah has come, Jesus. We're waiting on him to come back. Jews that don't believe in Jesus are waiting for the Messiah. So the good news is we're going to get the same guy at the same time. They're just wrong, okay? But Islam is waiting for a Messiah as well. Anybody know that? They're waiting for their Messiah. And could it be that when a man shows up and promises them peace, could it be? that they will follow that as the false Messiah. And that's why another reason it'll be so easy for the world to follow the Antichrist. The American church will follow the Antichrist anytime because he just says you can't buy or sell without my mark. Okay, <laughs> I got to have stuff. I can't live without that. I mean, God, Jesus will forgive me. Okay, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> So I think the American church will follow the Antichrist like nobody's business, but maybe this nation of Islam will too because they'll think it's their Messiah. That's just a maybe. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. My point is there's not going to be peace until the Antichrist comes. So don't get freaked out about instability in the Middle East. You turn on the news and that's all you hear is unrest in the Middle East. Do not get freaked out about it. We're in a circle right now. It's been going on for years, Pete said, and it's going to go on for years. It may look different in each circle cycle, but it's been going on. But do we see it? Do we know? Because to me, this is amazing. Like, this fires me up when I'm digging into this. I'm like, we're living in a biblical cycle. We're living in prophecy. Do you understand what I'm saying? We believe the past that happened. We believe the future is going to happen, but we're in the present, and our Bible is alive, and we're living in it. That should be encouragement. And this is a good versus evil discussion. At the, this is all a good versus evil discussion. Started in Genesis, ends in Revelation. It's not just history. So guys, this is a time we, sh we should be allowing our faith to be built. We have a choice. We either allow doubt to grow or faith. I'm going to choose faith. Here's the cool thing. You want some more encouragement? It doesn't matter if you're looking at the past, the present, the future. As Jesus believers, we're on the right side of history. It doesn't matter. If I die tomorrow, I'm with Jesus. If I die 20 years from now, I'm with Jesus. It doesn't matter. We're on the right side of this. We need to pray for the people of Israel to be protected. We need to pray against the spirit of Amalek, but we need to rest in knowing that Jesus has got us on the right side of everything. Last thing, look at when this attack happened. It happened at the end of Sukkot. When we're celebrating Jesus coming to live with us forever. And I ask you a few questions at the beginning of this. What does Halloween have to do with Hamas? And really that's just about letting a little bit of evil come in and calling it okay. And not understanding the consequences it has. My child has nightmares. Well, that's because you let him dress up like a demon and go out in public with other little demons and celebrate Satan once a year. It's got a consequence. We should expect it. Yeah. <laughs> but that may be the only way they see Jesus, or maybe they see Jesus when you stand up against evil and say, I can't tolerate evil. Hamas is in existence today because God's people literally didn't eradicate a little bit of evil. By the way, on Facebook every day this week, I'm on day five. I'm going to go two more days. I'm posting a scripture and how that applies. I'm going to print that out for everybody and give it to you next week so you can have that because I want it to apply. I want us to understand why this is evil and how it's scripturally evil. Neuralink. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Neuralink is a 
because uh, I said, what does a brain chip have to do with Hamas and Days of Noah? Neuralink is a brain chip that Elon Musk has invented. They put it in your head to fix. Okay, I'm going to pick on Pete. Pete tells me he's boogered up. I love that term. He's boogered up. And ne- the whole idea of Neuralink is you put a chip in Pete's brain and it tells his arm how to move now. But I thought as Christ followers, we were supposed to believe in the healing power of Jesus, not a chip to do it. And we're supposed to accept God's will when it doesn't go our way. Just saying. But when you implant a chip into someone and now you can make them smarter because that's the other piece of it. They can, you can download data into them so your child will be smarter. You've just created a Nephilim, a Nephilim, just a different one. That's why it's got to do with the days of Noah. And the reason I brought it up is because two weeks ago I read they're looking for their first human trial. Surgeons successfully transplanted a modified pig heart (laughs) into a human patient. And at the time that I got this, the person was awake and recovering with the organ fully functioning. So again, instead of trusting that God has our days numbered and that God's in control, And that Jesus' power can heal, we trust science. The days of Noah. This might be our version of the days of Noah. Maybe we're just in a cycle of the days of Noah, but this is a days of Noah. Is the Torah applicable? That's my final question. Is the Torah applicable to us today? Because Western Christianity as a whole discounts the Torah takes away the Old Testament, but everything I gave you today was out of Torah and Old Testament today. Everything. So if we do away with the Torah, we do away with the explanation of the present. And I hope you see how dangerous that is. Without understanding this, so why did I take time today and spend extra time? Because if we don't understand this, we might live in doubt of the future instead of faith that God is in control. He has a plan. We're just in a cycle. We should be excited about the future and the present, not in doubt or fear. So I hope everybody got this today. If you didn't, go back and listen to it, ask questions. I hope all the connections are coming together because this should be an exciting time to be alive as you're watching biblical prophecy happen. Let it grow your faith. Father, thank you that you laid out in Scripture and you allowed our simple-minded human brains to tie some things together for faith. So, Father, I pray that whether this was confusing or not or fully understand that, understood that people will grow their faith from this discussion. That we will grow our faith, that we will pray against doubt, that we will pray for your people and in support of your people, that we will pray against a spirit of Amalek in the name of Jesus, a spirit of doubt in the name of Jesus, that we will trust you when things look bleak, but we know you have a plan. Father, that we would want to eradicate evil from our lives. I didn't say perfect. Noah wasn't perfect. (laughs) But you found favor in him because he was trying, because he was righteous. So, Father, help us to squash the evil, to get it completely out, to recognize you as the holy, set-apart, one God that's in control of everything, and to not let anything in this world create doubt, but our faith would be so strong that it outweighs your doubt or outweighs the doubt that Satan tries to put into us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And while Peyton's getting started, I had this. It was in something that got sent to me. It said, if there were no Jewish people, there would be no return of Jesus. Think about that. If there were no Jewish people, there would be no need for a return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so um, after Peyton gets done, if anybody needs prayer, you can come up here for prayer. But remember to pray for Israel. When a rabbi would get up and he would give a talk or he would write something, another rabbi would come up and he would give his comments. Can I give my comments quickly? We've already been in here this long. Let's have a good time. You know, there's a story, this is off topic, but there is a story of a one rabbi, and the people would come from all over Israel to listen to him for days at a time, sitting out in the hot sun to listen. They'd listen 24 hours a day. They wouldn't even go to sleep sometimes. And we can't even make it a few hours normally. But 
I'll go in order of the thoughts as I was thinking them. Okay? He's talking about Torah a lot. What does Torah play in? Okay, who wants revival? Everybody's always talking about, oh, we're looking for the revival. And so what do we look to? We look to this scripture in Joel that says, in those final days, I'll pour out my spirit on all men. Right? We've, everybody sees that verse. What does Joel say before that? You've got to look at it in context. Joel says, when my people turn back to the Torah, I'll, pull out, I'll pour out my spirit on all men. So if you want to see revival, if you want to see spiritual awakening, and you're not keeping the commandments, then don't expect it. It will not happen. And people can get frustrated by that. That's okay. It's scripture. You can argue with God. He said it's not going to happen. Secondly, we call it Palestine. That comes from the Roman Latin word for land of the Philistines. So you're denying, when you call it Palestine, when you're talking about the Palestinians, you're denying Israel their right to the land. Because when the Romans exiled the Jews from Israel, as it was known to everyone, they called it the land of the Philistines to try to discredit Israel's claim. Okay, Jacob and Esau. I'm going my thoughts in order. Jacob and Esau. How does Jacob have the right to steal the blessing? This is baffling to most people. I'm going to give you my opinion. Jacob. So Esau is a very wicked person, right? We all know that. And so Jacob has no right to the blessing until Esau gives him the birthright. Then, biblically, he has to have the blessing or nobody gets anything. And it's stagnant. So this is part of that sins of the parents laid on the children. Isaac or Abraham was deceptive when it came to Sarah, right? This is my sister. Well, it's also my wife. What did Isaac do with Rebecca? This is my sister. Or this is, you know, oh, th this isn't my wife. And then the same thing almost happens. So this deception is going from generation to generation. And that plays out again with Jacob. But see, Jacob knew Israel, uh, uh, Esau is wicked. He cannot have this birthright. So even if it means I have to steal it from him, I have to do what I have to do. Did God ever reprimand Jacob for doing it? No. Because it was his. He didn't really steal it. Who said Jacob stole the birthright? Isaac didn't say it. Jacob didn't say it. God didn't say it. Rebecca didn't say it. Esau said he stole my birthright. He didn't steal it. It was his. He didn't steal the blessing. The blessing is part of the birthright. He just couldn't tell Isaac that because it would make Isaac so disheartened to know, wow, my son sold out my blessing. So he's actually protecting Isaac. He didn't steal it. See, Esau's whole claim is discrediting. Remember, when he comes out of the womb, he was trying to drag me back. He was trying to steal my blessing. But in Hebrew, what did it say? It never says he grabbed Esau's heel. It says he had his hand like this. Where's the soft spot on an infant? And if Esau's whole destiny is to kill him, wouldn't it have been real easy for Satan just to allow him to kick his head right there and he's dead? He was shielding himself. Esau's whole job is discrediting. Jacob never stole the birthright. Um, really interesting. There's the, so King Agag, the Amalekite that's allowed to live, there's a theory that there's an Amalekite in every generation. An Agagite. So we know Haman. But that one's proved, but here's the real here's conspiracy theory. I'll go John for a minute. Do, 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 do. Hitler was physically, not only spiritually an Agagite, but also descended from Haman. And one that would really hit home for everybody since we've been talking about it, the most recent one is Osama bin Laden. That physically there's one in every generation. Think about 9-11, Agag. <laughs> I knew we were just waiting on one. All right, I got to end this quick or he's going to start telling us how Michelle's a dude. So. <laughs> uh, sure, we thank you. Just like you bestowed the blessing on Jacob, please send us out this week with a blessing. May the Lord 
May the Lord bless and keep you. May his grace and his face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace. May the Lord, may the Lord bless and keep you. May his grace and his face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace Adonai Vishmarecha Ya'er panavilecha vichunecha Yisa Adonai panavilecha V'yasim lecha shalom V'yasim lecha shalom This is the way you shall be blessed from day to day he'll be your rest so may the lord may the lord bless and keep you may his grace and his face shine upon you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace and give